Grace and peace to you from God our Father, from Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, as I, I was getting ready, uh, talking to Pastor Ruda, uh, he said, feel free to walk around the Smithsonian today. I won't do that the whole time. But I have to start out this way because it's, it's the importance of the beginning. Uh, you maybe heard this song before. Uh, it's uh, part of one of the most popular musicals, and if you see most high schools do this like every five, six years. But a man who says, if I were a rich man, one of the most popular plays to fiddle on the roof that Tevye sings about if he were a rich man. What he says, I think why this song is is so uh, hits home with people is the words are thoughts that I think we all have, right? Well, what if I was just a little more wealthy? Wouldn't that be a bad thing? To have a little bit more money, to have a little bit more easy? Uh, he starts out by saying, Dear God, you made many, many poor people. I realize, of course, that it's no shame to be poor, but it's no great honor either. So what would have been so terrible if I had a small fortune? He goes on and lists what life would be like if he were a wealthy man. But the last words of this song say this. Would it spoil some vast eternal plan if I were a wealthy man? Hmm. Fascinating. When you hear our text and, and what Jesus talks to this wealthy man about, it's an interesting question. To think about being wealthy, does that spoil some eternal plan? What we want to focus on today is not just wealth, but our priorities in life and, and seeking the good. To understand what is really good in life, and for many people that's wealth, but that can be all sorts of things. So as Jesus talks to this wealthy man, we want us to, to think about what is really good. What does God want us to focus on in this life and to understand true good in this difficult and hard world? What we see as this man approaches Jesus is he starts out in, in a pretty good way. We see that he comes up and uh, he must have known something about Jesus. Most likely he had heard about him, maybe heard he's doing miracles, but notice what he calls him. He says, good teacher. And then he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He knows that uh, this man had something good to share, and so he calls him good teacher. And then he asks an important question. This is one of the things that we should think about in our lives, that we want to, to be asking the right question to the right people. For this man, he thought Jesus was the right person, and he is, and he's asking this important question, one of those important questions that people always are seeking after. You think about several of those lifelong questions that people are always seeking to answer. How do I get to heaven? That's what he's saying. How does one get eternal life? Questions of, is there a God? What happens when you die? What is the purpose of life? These are these important questions. And we say there's no dumb questions. And he's asking important questions. And he's asking the right person. Think about in, in our life, who do you go to to ask questions? And who is our world encouraged to, to go for answers? What's the easy thing today? I think about how life has changed, right? Um, people used to sit around, and if you'd ask a question, then someone in that group needed to know that answer. And now, if you're sitting around a bonfire or hanging out, you ask a question, and what does everyone do? Searches on their phone. It's now, who can get the answer the quickest? And who's giving you the answer? Well, it's Google. And now I see all the commercials where instead of, now it's, remember the days where you had to type into your phone and ask a question? Now you can just speak, and then it'll give you the answer. Oh, typing was so hard. Now you can just ask your phone. But 
Who's giving you the answer? Google, AI, and is, can you trust that answer? So it's good for us to think about asking the right questions to the right people. And one thing I've, I've heard, I, I study uh, people who leave Christianity. I like to follow people who, who have had questions about Christianity. And they always say this. They say, I could never ask any questions. Do you know what's true in Christianity? That you can't ask questions if you have doubts, if you have questions that you can't ask them. I, I think at, at Zion, and my hope is here at Emmanuel, I think Pastor Ruda, he welcomes questions. And in, in a world where we're sinful people and we live in a difficult uh, world with, with pain and trouble and our God is amazing, questions are good and we have doubts. And I think it's important to think about the type of questions we ask. I would say as a, a teacher, there's, there's no dumb question, but the, the type of question you ask is kind of important. That sometimes people ask very simple questions, and those are good, but when kids start asking these complex questions, you know they're really getting deep, and they're thinking, and I love that. I love having those good conversations. And so, ask your question. I think... What we're going to see in a little bit is, even though people ask those questions, we'll see about the answers. Because what happens with Jesus? Jesus does this very often. When, when people ask him questions, does he give an answer right away? Or give a straightforward answer? <coughs> Here this man says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? Does that have anything to do with this question? Because he says, no one is good except God alone. And so he gives him an answer to something. He's, he's saying, what is good? No one except God alone. And notice the irony. Who is he speaking to? He's speaking to Jesus. To God. But he hears this. And Jesus says the rest of his answer. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, and you should not defraud. Honor your father and mother. That kind of second table of the law. Treat uh, others uh, with love. And notice what he says. Then he says, teacher. He doesn't say good anymore. <laughs> Even though he is the good God, the good and perfect God. He says, all this I have kept since I was a boy. Now we realize he wasn't really listening to Jesus' words. Because what did Jesus say? No one is good except God alone. And Jesus says, do all these things. Love your neighbor. And he says, oh, yeah, I've been good. All these things I've done since I was a boy. He's not listening. It may seem like Jesus' point was not related to the question, but then when we see his answer, he's not getting it. He thinks he's good. And and. I think the truth is, either he's kind of blind, or he, he thinks he's actually good, and, and so he says this, but why is he there? Why is he think, asking this question about eternal life if he knows he's good, if he's done these things? Why would he be coming to Jesus to ask this question? So I think he knows there's something missing. And as he says this, Jesus says something. Jesus looked at him and loved him. We'll get to that a little bit later, but he doesn't yell at him. He doesn't say, oh gosh, how silly you are, but he loves him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had This man thinks he was good. He had kept everything. But Jesus knew the one thing, in reality, there were more things, but that one thing that he knew he could not give up. The one thing that he had higher than God. And so he goes away sad. Even though Jesus had said, come follow me. He's calling him to be a disciple. Leave these things and follow me. I, 
had, had missed this so many times when reading this before, but he's saying, come be my disciple, and what does he do? Walks away. I think the truth is that we ask good questions, but a lot of times we don't stay around to hear the hard answers. We hear a little bit of an answer, and it's, it's something that hurts, or it's a little difficult. That law that, that gets at us, but there's more. We see that as Jesus spoke these words, and he talks about how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God, and the disciples say, oh, this, is, this is hard, it's hard teaching. Jesus says it's harder than a camel, one of the biggest animals to enter through a needle, a thin of a needle then for a rich to go into heaven. And the disciples say, who could be saved? But Jesus says this amazing answer. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. This is the gospel message. Even this man who's rich he can be saved. It's not up to him. It's not about being good, but he didn't stick around. He didn't stick around to hear the good answer about salvation. That it's not about him being good or about his wealth. But this man, his priority was in the wrong place. This was what he found his identity in. He was a good man and a wealthy man, and he could not separate this. He couldn't find his identity in being a follower of Jesus. So we have to ask ourselves, do we do similar things? Do we look to the good in life instead of the eternal God. The encouragement here, we can talk about wealth and money, but I think what's important is to look at all the priorities of life. To look at all the things that, that get in our way of putting God first. All the good things. There's a, a philosopher, uh, his name is um, David Foster Wallace. He passed away a couple years ago. But in a commencement speech, he's, he was talking about worship. And he, and he says this, In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. He says, if you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough truth. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. On one level, we all know this stuff already. It's been codified as myths, proverbs, cliches, epigrams, parables, the skeleton of every great story. What he's saying is, here we are, we, we worship God, and there's so many people out in the world that they think, you know, I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in any God. I don't worship anything. And he's saying, in day-to-day -day life, there are no atheists. Everyone worships something. He lists money or beauty. Maybe it's worshiping your work and that identity that you get from that job. Maybe it's, it's family. Maybe it's your kids. That you have to do all these things for your kids, and they have to be in every sport, all these things. There's so many things that we can worship. Maybe you worship politics as an election is coming up. You put all your hope in that. You find your identity in, in that. The hard thing is that a lot of these things are good. It's not saying money is bad or family is bad. But, as we talked about before in our kids' sermon, these things are, are temporary. They're huge, awesome blessings from God. But they're temporary. And so, God says, yes, love these things, but put them in the right perspective. A couple things to think about is to, to say, 
yes, okay, we worship God, but do we fall into the same trap that the rest of the world falls into of worshiping the wrong thing? To think about what do you love so much that if that thing was taken away, that this was taken away, would you be inconsolable? Would, would there be nothing that could give you peace? And I'm not saying that th those, this, is, this is hard because we're supposed to love those things. That God has given us these things, but can we see that God is still there? That God loves you still? And that he has a purpose in all things, especially to give you eternal life. If he's given you Jesus, if he's given you Christ, then he'll be with you even in the darkest time. Because the, the truth is, there's going to be a time in your life where most of your friends are gone. Maybe your wealth is gone. Your family's gone. If all those things are gone and you only have God, all those blessings, all those things are gone and it's only God, how would you feel? Can you still be happy? Can you be filled with joy to just have God? That might be a weird thing to think about, but what if you only had God? That'd be good. Would that give you joy and peace? Because this is what he's saying. Don't just seek the good. You have good, but seek the eternal God. Because most of all, he has given you Jesus. And Jesus is that perfect and loving Savior. The, the irony of this all, again, was that this man called Jesus good, and he says, no one is good except God, but there Jesus is, the, the perfect God. The perfect God who even though we struggle with priorities, you know what Jesus didn't struggle with? He always had God's will in mind. He always, even though he, he became a man, and he was asked to go to the cross and to die for the sins of the world, it says that he set his heart resolutely to go to Jerusalem. And even though he, he knew the pain that was approaching, he, he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, have him, to, to know that even though this was hard, to, that this was God's will to go to the cross. We struggle with priorities, but, but Jesus did not. And Jesus was perfect in your place. And it, as it said, that Jesus looked at him and loved him. It's important for us to see what God's word does. Because as God loves us, does that mean he's never going to confront us? That things are never going to be hard? Jesus confronted this, this rich man with difficult words. That, that God, through his word, through Jesus, through law, our hearts are going to be confronted. We're going to be called out for our sin. But he doesn't leave us with that. He loves us so much to give us the gospel truth that all of our sins are forgiven. That nothing can separate us from his love. Because if we, we look at this, if we think we can do it on our own like this rich man, we're going to fall short. But Jesus is the Savior because it says, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible. Because the truth is, on our own, who could be saved? If it was up to us to, to make our way up to heaven, none of us would. We'd, we'd all fall short. And we'd be all so focused on the worldly things that we'd never make it to eternal life. And so we have this loving, perfect Savior, Jesus, who makes the impossible who works faith in your hearts, who helps you in this broken world where we struggle with the difficulties of life, with the tragedies of life, with the brokenness, to help us to see that 
he loves us in the midst of all of this. To lean on him. To lean on his words and to know that God is with you in all things. And that when hardships come, the hardest of hardships, that God is greater. That God gives us so many blessings, so many good things. Loving God is eternal. And He wants you with Him there forever. Where your loved ones are, where all believers are. So we can know and understand what truly is with all. So we don't have to fear not just to search for what is good in this life, 